Hey guys. <clears throat> All right, before I begin, I'd like to ask a question, and um, just with a quick showing of hands, how many of us here today have taken a course in biology? All right. How many of us here today think we could still pass a final exam in biology? <laughs> All right then, so I should probably review a quick concept or two for those of us that didn't pay attention or didn't try or maybe just didn't care about that class. Um, let's talk about evolution. Evolution states that in response to environmental conditions or pressures, certain characteristics will become more beneficial relative to those conditions or pressures. They become more beneficial by endowing the organisms or individuals with those traits with higher reproductive success rates or higher survival rates. Now all this means is that detrimental or not as beneficial characteristics will fade out of prominence and eventually out of a population. This is best summarized as survival of the fittest. Now, thanks to the idea of survival of the fittest, the theory of evolution, and the notion of inherited characteristics, we can trace organismal lineage back to the dawn of life and the simplest microorganisms. With that said, could anyone please raise their hand and give me a guess as to what was the first specialized organ to develop? Don't be shy. Spencer. The eye is incorrect. Anyone else? You. The lungs. the lungs, that's a good guess, but it's also incorrect. You. The skin is incorrect. It's the small intestine. Your lower bowel is the oldest part of you. The part of you that, can be, that existed prior to any other form or function and can be traced farthest back into that aforementioned organismal lineage. Now, there are a plethora of ways that we can interpret this data. One way to interpret it is to consider every other cell, every other tissue, every other organ, every other system, every other part of you, from the integuments coding and insulating you to the red blood cells running, running through our veins at this very instant as nothing more than accessories, periphery objects, tools, or ploys meant to get more food down that tube or more food down that tube more efficiently which unfortunately kind of makes sense. I mean, our eyes allow us to identify and visualize palatable species of foods. Our ears allow us to listen to and track prey. Our legs facilitate giving this prey chase, and our hands are nothing more than glorified meat hooks for the purpose of funneling and conveying food down that tube. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I think this catch as catch can, what came first, the chicken or the egg sort of mentality towards humanity is, a little bit misanthropic. I mean, it belittles all of humanity. It equates all of human history, human accomplishment, and human activity to nothing more than a visceral avarice engineered, pursued, and obtained solely for the purpose of appeasing our small intestine. So I'd like to take a quick digression and pose a question. Um, what are we told about single parent children? What are we told about runaways? What are we told about kids from broken homes? What are we told about boys raised without a father? What are we told about people like me? Society tells us that we're damaged goods, that we're troubled students, and that we're unlikely to become productive members of society. Statistics like those from the American Journal of Public Health tell us that we're 11 times as likely to be physically or verbally abusive towards our peers. The US Department of Health and Services tells us that we're three times as likely to, to drop out of high school, and the Bureau of Justice Statistics tells us that we're four times as likely to find ourselves in juvenile detention centers or psychiatric hospitals. All of these truths and the preconceived notions that come along with them are contradicted by the work and existence of people like Mr. Casey Gwynn, CEO and founder of the National Family Justice Center Alliance, and my friend who tells us that we can either love these kids at 10 or 11 or we can lock them up at 17 or 18. Over the past few decades, Mr. Gwynn has spent incalculable amounts of time and effort and money to ensure that his programs to help others could be enacted. Programs like Camp Hope, which is a week-long summer intensive retreat that takes these kids from their often vitriolic environments and facilitates seminal convalescence and socialization to environments that are far more conducive to producing these good kids. Um, and I was enrolled at this camp as a counselor, and in retrospect, I probably learned as much, if not more, than most of my campers, because I'm as evolutionarily disillusioned, judgmental, and selfish as the next guy. And before meeting these kids, my kids, I would have seen the statistics on their papers and written them off as bad kids. But they're not, they're not bad kids. Frankly, they're, they're not good kids either, because they're amazing kids. 
On paper, there were statistics and attention deficits and behavioral disorders and disrespect to authority and peers that predicted future convicts and unwed mothers and shortened life expectancies. But in person, they were just innocent kids who had a disproportionate burden. What these papers and statistics failed to show was the struggle that they exemplified and the promise and ambition that they espoused. And if I can, I would like to share a few select stories about some campers who, for the sake of non-disclosure agreements, I will call Gary, Matilda, Robert, and Chris. Now, Gary admitted to me that he wasn't a very good student, something about not being able to sit still for too long and not just not focus. But he told me that he really liked stars. So for the next week, whenever I had free time, I would talk to Gary about life cycles of stars and cosmology and the potential for extraterrestrial life and spaghettification and black holes. And by the end of the week, he hadn't gleaned much, but he told me that he knew he wanted to do better in school, that he needed to do better in school so he could go to college unlike his parents. And so he could discover great things and do great things while studying astrophysics. Gary was nine. And then there's Matilda, who lived in a house whose walls only served as a constant reminder of the terrible things that her father had done to her and her mother. But at camp, she was presented with a Congress that was willing to listen and understand and be compassionate. And by the end of the week, her tick, a haiku flinch that presented itself whenever anyone near her raised their hand, had vanished. By the end of the week, she stopped trying to hide those bruises stapled into her upper arm and told me that they were no longer flaws, but a reminder of where she'd come from and why she so badly wanted to be a family therapist. Matilda was 14. Then there's Robert, who prior to coming to camp had been released from a juvenile detention center about a week earlier and who confessed to me that prior to coming to camp, he'd only been sober and free of hard drugs like heroin and who knows what else for a few months. Robert, who confessed to me that at the beginning of camp, his biggest ambition, his life goal was not dying before seeing 18. But after being surrounded for a week by people who didn't see him as a defect or a failure, but as a friend and a person, he told us that his biggest ambition was getting his life back on track so he could finish school and come back to, count, come back to camp as a counselor and teach these kids that they're not failures and that they're not lost causes and that people from terrible circumstances can improve and change. And lastly, Robert was 14. And lastly, there's Chris. Chris, who came to camp fragmented and distraught over the imminent divorce of his parents and the constant bickering that his home afforded him. Chris, who for some reason or other found blame in himself for his situation at home and had decided and was all but willing to kill himself. Chris, who came to camp unwilling to share his story but reluctantly did and found consolation in people like Mr. Gwynn. Chris has since started therapy and is back on track to graduate and wants to be a pediatrician so he can always work with kids. Chris was 17, now 18, and stands before you. Hi. There are still people who give themselves to lost causes like that of troubled youth. There are still people who decide to ignore the misanthropy, to not heed statistics, and instead give humanity a chance. By putting on these programs, I don't think that Mr. Gwynn is fulfilling some kind of primordial evolutionary selfishness. And by volunteering my time, I don't feel like I'm providing lunch to, or by any other means, appeasing my small intestine. If anything, the giving of one's effort or one's time for the benefit of others ignores that instinctive animalistic need to appease the small intestine and simultaneously rejects that misanthropic interpretation of humanity. With another quick showing of hands, how many of us here today have given money to a cause or an organization? Even a nickel, anything. How many of us here have shared food, either by way of canned food drives or breaking bread with a hungry friend? How many of us here are willing to give our time or our effort or our money or our blood for causes bigger than ourselves? That's really cool. I think everyone's raising their hands. <laughs> That's fantastic. That right there, that ability to impress instinct, oppress instinctive animalistic needs and instead give oneself or one's time or one's property for the benefit of others is community service. But why does that matter? Plainly stated, community service disproves science. It rewrites biology and it rejects misanthropy because no other species is willing to give itself in its entirety unselfishly for the benefit of others without expecting any degree of reciprocation or some kind of direct benefit yielded unto itself. 
Anything great that humanity has accomplished or will accomplish is rooted in community service and based in the giving of oneself to others, from art, which has always done more for the audience and will do for the artist, to government, which historically has done more for the governed than the governing, and revolution, which we all know will do more for posterity and progeny than it will the founding fathers. War, genocide, arson, and larceny are all terrified of being photographed because they have to be compared to the benevolent altruism that is community service. Community service that unfortunately is too often thought to be only synonymous with these grandiose and punctuated examples of donation and charity. And in reality, it's a lot smaller. It's not glamorous and it's not big. It's local, it's inherently communal. Community service is teaching our kids that they're not broken, that their hands may be small, but they can hold and they can fix the world. Community service is teaching our kids to compost and to recycle and to live sustainably so they can treat our Mother Earth responsibly and with respect, to give a few examples. Community service matters because it separates theory from reality, man from beast, and it is at the basis of what it means to be human.